So every Christmas, you go around and, and you see this message that I know I see often a bumper sticker, put Christ back into Christmas. And if you love Christmas like I do, and you believe and know that the center and heart of Christmas is it's all about celebrating Jesus, it's not about Santa or Christmas trees, there's a part of you that kind of goes, yeah, you know, when you see that message. But when we stop and think about this a little bit, I think, well, who is this message for? I mean, certainly not us. I mean, we are putting Christ in Christmas. We're celebrating Christ at Christmas time. So really, this message is for all those non-believers that aren't celebrating Jesus enough. And so if we're really asking non-believers to put Christ in Christmas, then we're really basically asking them, would you just fake it for us and pretend you believe in Jesus once a year? And we think somehow, if we put, if other people that aren't Christians talk about Jesus one time a year at Christmas time, then maybe everything's going to get better and our world is going to be okay. Maybe if someone wishes Merry Christmas or just says the name of Jesus, and magically all the problems in our nation are going to be just fine. And we stop and realize that's actually kind of silly, really that really the problems in our world and the problems in our country are so much deeper than just whether or not people celebrate Jesus on one holiday one time a year. That really the solution we need is far deeper and far more radical. That what we really need is to put Christ in Christians. That we're the ones that need to change, not those non-Christians. We're the ones that need Jesus to be living in us and working through us. And this really is the essence of what it means to be a disciple in the first place. That you walk through the door and you look up and you see the whole reason our church exists. That we exist to honor God by making more disciples of Jesus Christ. And the first disciple that needs to be made is you. It's me. That it starts not with someone else changes, changing, it starts with you and me changing. It starts saying, I'm the one that needs Jesus. I'm the one that I want Jesus to come and fill my life and fill my heart and center everything around me. And that's the whole heart. And so here, the last three weeks, we talked about three questions that will change your life, that we are really serious about growing as disciples of Christ. And really, as we understand what it even means to be a disciple, the disciple is a Christian that increasingly loves Jesus, knows Jesus, and is like Jesus. In essence, a Christian is a Christian who has Christ put in the center of their lives. And so that's why we're doing this series. I'm really excited. We are going to be walking through the entire Gospel of John together. And the whole reason we're going through John is because we want to see Jesus. One of the things we learned is that we become like what we behold. And so the whole purpose of this series is that we would behold Jesus more and more as a church family. And so you and I would become more like Jesus and we would put Christ into us as Christians. Now to that end, I want to introduce you to a spiritual tool. So you're going to get very familiar with these. I love these. This is a scripture journal. And so why I love this, for one thing, I I actually have a hard time writing in my Bible. Some people really do a lot. But I love that you can open this up and it has the entire text of the Gospel of John in it. And because it's not technically your Bible, you can write all over it. You can circle words, you can underline phrases, you can draw arrows to show relationships. And that really helps you as you seek to really understand the full of what the text is saying. And then you notice there's this blank open spot here, and that's to write notes. Some of the best notes you can write are questions. You know, this did not make any sense to me when I heard it in Jeff's sermon or when I read it. And what does this mean, God? And you keep those questions or things that God teaches you or things that you learn or ways that this stretches you or the application. As you learn in a sermon or in a small group, you learn what this means and you write it down. And the whole idea is at the end of our series in John, you've got this whole background to look at as a remembrance. And I don't know about you, I actually learn better when I write something down. That something happens when I write down something that I hear, it helps me remember it more. And so that's my heart for you, is this would help you to do that. Now, 
also we're going to be going through the Gospel of John in small groups. So we have eight small groups that are going to be walking through the Gospel of John in tandem with the message. And so typically that the sermon will focus on one part of a chapter in John and the small group will purposely focus on the other part in the Gospel of John so that we just see more and more and they work in tandem together. And the idea is we are just basking in the person of Jesus through this whole series. And so uh, you can pick this up. So this is going to be very familiar at our next steps table. So um, if you're online, you can get these on Amazon for $7. We um, got these in bulk for $3 a piece, and we're asking for a $2 donation. Something that I love is a couple people came up this last week and said, hey, here's $10. I want to pay for myself and the next four people after me. So if you don't have $2 cash today, I don't really carry cash around either a lot today, just go and get one. Like, and even if you're not paying for it, because we just want to get this in your hands. We want you to have this tool so you can really get the most out of this series and this time together. And so we begin this series with a bang. Like this first section of scripture, it is John chapter 1, verse 1 to 18. And I want to invite you to turn there with me. So you can turn in your scripture journal. You can turn by looking at the, pay, the words on the screen. You can turn in your phone or turn in the Bible you brought from home. And this first passage is just one of the most packed, powerful sections of scripture, especially the first five verses are some of just the most densely packed verses in the entire Bible. And so when we begin, and it's going to show us two shifts and things that need to change in our thinking as we go through in verse 1 to 5 and then verse 6 to 13. So look with me. John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So... The story of Jesus does not begin in 5 BC in a manger in Bethlehem with a cute little baby. If you really want to understand who Jesus is, you have to go much further back. You have to go to in the beginning, to eternity past, before there was time, before there was creation. Because that's where Jesus begins. Jesus is eternal. He has always existed. He has always been. And it doesn't say in the beginning was Jesus. It could have said that. But John, in his his gospel, helps us understand who Jesus is by describing Jesus as the Word. Now, this is so packed in what this means. So throughout the Old Testament, you had the concept of the Word. You didn't know it was a person. But the Word was what made God unique. This is dabar in Hebrew. So the idea of the Word throughout the Old Testament is God is a self-revelatory God. God is a God who speaks and communicates communicates. That's what makes God different from these mute idols that don't talk. That God speaks because God's alive. The idols don't because they're dead and they're not really God's. And so the word is this self-revelation of God, the communication of God. When God's word goes forth in the Old Testament, it's always true. And so the word of God is always true. It is always the truth. And what's different between God's word and our words is our words, we speak and nothing really happens. God speaks and reality changes. So God's word is powerful. So when it introduces Jesus by saying Jesus is the word, it's saying Jesus is the debar. Jesus is the self-revelation of God. Jesus is the truth of God. Jesus is the power of God. That Jesus communicates, helps us to see and know who God really is. That God is alive and active. But in Greek, this word that's actually written there is the word logos. This is really a cool word because the logos is the order and structure that holds the universe together. So we would think of it in terms of the laws of chemistry and physics. Like how this world holds together or the strong nuclear force that holds the atom together or dark energy and dark matter that hold the universe together. That the powerful forces by which the universe could not exist if it were not for the logos. And it's saying, you want to know who Jesus is? He's not just some cute baby. He's the logos. He is the one that holds the universe together. Colossians teaches us, in Christ, all things hold together. That's amazing. In the beginning was the Word who was with God. So this means one who is connected and associated with God. And the Word was God and is God at the same time. Now, how is that possible? 
that Jesus could be connected to God, with God, and be fully God at the same time. This is the Trinity. That God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That there is only one God, but God has three persons. The Father is fully God, the Spirit is fully God, and yes, Jesus, the Word, is fully God in himself. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 2, he was in the beginning with God. So this is mind-blowing because before, when the people of the Old Testament, when they heard about the Debar, the Word of God, or when Greeks thought about the Logos, they thought about it. They thought about a spiritual force or at something in nature. But this reveals in verse 2, no. God's self-revelation is not a force. It's not an it. The forces that hold the universe together is not an it. It's a he. It's personal, that the word of God is a person that you can know and see and have a relationship with. Now, that's one that just kind of goes with your mind. Did you ever think the forces of chemistry have a name? And the forces, the laws of physics are personal? That it's not just some cold force of nature. It's a real person that knows you and loves you and is doing this for your benefit. He was in the beginning with God. Verse 3, all things were made, notice, through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So it's striking technically that it doesn't say that the word is the creator. It says the word is the one through whom all the universe, all creation came into existence. So how did God create the universe? Remember Genesis 1-3? And God said... Let there be light, and there was light. That the word of God was the force by whom is so powerful and so glorious that God brought all the entire universe into existence. So you want to get a sense of how powerful and amazing Jesus is. Think about, well, there's about at least a trillion galaxies just that we know of that are out there. And each of these galaxies has about a hundred billion stars in them. And so he's the one that called into existence with one word, a trillion hundred billion stars into existence, and they existed because of his power. Like, that's mind-blowing, just how powerful Jesus is, just how powerful the personal word of God is. Verse 4, in him was life. That the word, Jesus, is the source of life. That life could not exist if it were not for the word. If it weren't for the one through whom the universe was created. If it weren't for the logos that holds everything together literally through the strong nuclear force. Jesus is holding every one of the atoms and molecules in your body together right now. If he were to let go, you would just simply cease to exist. Like this is how personally involved Jesus is in your life. That all of our lives flow from Jesus. And in him was life, and the life was the light of men. And you see a connection that Jesus isn't just the life, he's the light. And you see the relation between these two. Well, okay, how is light related to life? Okay, what would happen if we took away our sun? Like, we would die so fast. Like, it'd probably be a matter of, like, seconds until we died. Maybe after the nine minutes of the light from the sun, you know, got to earth. But we couldn't survive at all without light. Without the light of the sun, without the warmth of the sun, we couldn't exist. And so our life is dependent, and everything is dependent on the light of the word of God that flows from Jesus. And that's just one of the trillions upon trillions upon trillions of stars that he created. That's amazing. And then I love this verse right here in verse 5. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So if you were there at the moment of creation, what would you have seen? Genesis 1-2. And darkness was over the surface of the deep. It would have been darkness, nothingness, non-existent. And then what happened? And God said, let there be light. And light burst through. And what happened to that darkness? The darkness dispelled in the presence of the light. Why? Because of the nature of darkness. Did you know darkness doesn't exist? Darkness is simply the absence of life. It's the absence of substance. There is no darkness, really. 
There's only the absence of light. So every time the light shines through, it dispels the darkness. Now there's a word, and the darkness cannot overcome it. The darkness is not overcome at the end of verse 5. And so the darkness is powerless against the light. Now some of your translations, if you're reading your Bible, says the darkness has not understood it. And actually, this is something that's really cool about Greek, is Greek has the ability to say two things at once. And so the darkness is powerless against the light, and the darkness doesn't even understand the light because really the darkness isn't even a thing. It doesn't even exist. And so what is needed is the light of Jesus to shine, and the darkness just melts away. Now, why is this so, so important for you and I? Because as American Christians living in the 21st century, we have been afraid of the dark. We have cursed the darkness. We've whined and complained about the darkness and how powerful the darkness is, how bad it is, and all these people that don't believe in Jesus and these people that don't worship Jesus and don't do what's right. Well, when you look biblically at the darkness, what is darkness? It literally doesn't exist. All darkness is is the absence of light. So rather than being people that are shifted and focused on being afraid of the darkness, we shift to the light. Really, what's needed is not for the, to fight against the darkness, it's just for the light to shine. And once the light shines, the darkness just dispels because it's powerless against it. It doesn't even understand it. And so what is needed, and this is the first shift, it's not for you and I to be better at fighting against the darkness. Actually, what's needed is for us to stop worrying about the darkness and shift all our attention and all our heart toward the light. And that we magnify our view of Jesus. The larger our view of Jesus, the more we see Jesus as he really is, the darkness seems silly by comparison. And so we just stand in awe of the light. And I love this that we become like what we behold. I think that's a really important principle for our church as we grow in Christ-likeness, that we are people that just more and more, we behold the light of Jesus, and then we become, we reflect the light of Jesus. And people see the light of Jesus through our lives that dispels the darkness. And that is life-changing for you and I, and that's life-changing for the world around us. And so that's the first shift. Let us be people that are enamored, in love, focused on the light of Christ to the point where we don't even really recognize the darkness because the darkness really is nothing. There's a second shift that needs to happen, and we see that in verse 6 to verse 13. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. Now, it's kind of amazing. You have five of the most densely packed, amazing verses in all Scripture. They're trying to describe the indescribable Jesus. And then you have three verses like, oh, yeah, there's this guy, John. He's a witness. He just points at Jesus. Like, it's almost kind of comical how small it is. And that's a picture of you and me. That's what we are. Compared to the greatness and grandeur of Jesus, we're just a guy or a woman. And it's like, we're just here to point out Jesus. That's really our role and what our lives are about. Because it's not about us, it's all about him. Verse 9, the true light which enlightens everyone. And so the light of Jesus is really for everyone. The true light which enlightens everyone was coming into the world. Now, the more we've been listening to verse 1 to 5, the more this verse in verse 9 just shocks us. Like, wait a minute here. How is that possible? So basic principle, the creator is always greater than the creation. So Jesus is the one by whom countless trillions of stars came into being. So Jesus is greater than the countless trillions of stars throughout the universe. Okay, what would happen if just one of those stars that Jesus created, like our sun, came into the world? It's like the earth would melt. Like we couldn't survive such an encounter. So you're trying to think through... Just the more I understand the greatness and power and wonder of Jesus, like, how is it even possible that Jesus came to earth? Like, how did we survive such an encounter? Like, there's no way that should have been possible. That's shockingly amazing. Like, how could that happen and us not just die as a result? Verse 10, he was in the world. 
It's really clear that actually the wonderful, all-powerful word of God came into this world and you're just shaking your head like, how did that happen? And the world was made through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. So here from one mind blower to the next, like one, how is it even possible that someone so great, glorious and so amazing came into the world, but how is it possible that anyone missed it? I mean, how could the word of God come into this world and we wouldn't all notice it and be transformed? Like, that seems ridiculously impossible. And so our brain's twisting like two different ways as we're trying to comprehend these verses and it doesn't really make sense. And I think so often we, we go so fast to try to make sense of scripture that we need just to stop and be puzzled. And when we read things in scripture that don't really make sense, we need to stop to really understand and just say, that does not make any sense to me, Lord. Like, I need to understand that. And that's where we really grow deeper in our understanding and love of scripture. Verse 12. But to all who did receive him, there were some that saw. There were some that got it. So to all who did receive him, who believed in his name. So, hear this beautiful verse. What does it mean to believe in Jesus? The first thing is that we receive him. That when Jesus comes, our arms are wide open and we welcome him into our life. We welcome him into our heart. That we have a heart that wants to receive him. Who believed in his name. Now, what does it mean to believe in his name? Now, when someone says you have a good name, that's not saying that, you know, the name Heather or Jeff or Ben or you know, whatever your name is, is, is really that good of a name. It's really a statement about you and who you are. Because when you say the name of someone you know, you think of their person, their character, what they're like. And so believing in the name of Jesus isn't like a magic formula, like I say the word Jesus. It's I know who Jesus is. I know his character. I know his person, his heart. And I believe in him. Now, the word believe, I love this. And I think it's really important for us to grow in our belief. The word believe is Greek and pisteo, and it means two things simultaneously. So the first thing is it means to understand. So that I understand the truth about Jesus. I intellectually know who he is. I understand that he's the son of God. I know that he's came to save, that I know the truth, and I'm, I understand the truth about Jesus. Second thing it means at the same time is I trust him. That emotionally, I trust Jesus. I believe in him. I, I depend upon him. I need him. Because it's not enough to just know truths about Jesus if you don't trust him. Now, this also is in the present progressive tense in Greek. And so what does that mean? English doesn't do this very well. The idea is that it's growing. It's dynamic. So things that are alive, that are living, are dynamic and they grow. And so to say I believe in Jesus means I understand Jesus and I'm continually growing in my understanding of Jesus. I trust Jesus and I'm continually growing in my trust in Jesus. That the idea of a faith that is stagnant, that I learned this truth 30 years ago and I haven't learned anything new about Jesus since. Is that really faith? Is that really belief? That yeah, I trusted him in Sunday school when I was five years old and I prayed a prayer, but I haven't trusted him anymore since I was five. Is that really faith? See, things that aren't dynamic, that don't grow and change, are dead. And so the heart of what it really means to believe is that we have a heart that is open to continually receiving Jesus. We're growing in our understanding of Jesus, and we're growing in our trust in Jesus. And that process never ends. And so, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, this is really cool, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. So if King Charles of England were to adopt you into his family to be his son or daughter, how would that change your life? Everything would change. Like the whole world would know your name because that would make international news if King Charles adopted you into his family. You would have access to the family fortune. You would get an allowance like the members of that family get. So instantly you'd be rich. Instantly you'd have so much money you'd never be able to spend it all. You would have instant fame, instant glory, and you would have access to part of the power that King Charles has. So everything would change 
dramatically beyond probably anything that you could ever accomplish on your own ability simply by being adopted as a child of the king. Okay, truth is, King Charles is nice and all, but like he's actually not a, even a real king. Like he doesn't really have power. I mean, he does and he doesn't. And it's just one country on one planet of the earth. And he seems a little stiff to me, and maybe that's too harsh. But like, I think there are other people I'd rather have a close relationship with than King Charles. But if that would change your life dramatically and be an amazing thing, what would it mean for you to become a child of God? God really does have power. Not just one country, one planet. This entire universe is all his. It's all created by him. And you talk about the riches of the Tudor family fortune, the riches of God who owns the universe is infinitely greater. And then the fame and the glory of being a child of God is so much greater than any fame or glory you ever could get on this earth. And while it might be a little awkward to get really close to King Charles, there's nothing more wonderful than getting close to King Jesus and being infinitely loved and valued and receiving from him. In fact, that would change your life forever. And you know what? If you believe in Jesus, and I know so many of you really do, that is true of you. And I want to say the second shift that really needs to happen is that we need to change not just how we view Jesus, but actually change the way we view ourselves. That the core truth of who you are is you are a child of God. And there's no birth, there's no work, there's nothing you could ever accomplish on this earth that would even come close to comparing to that. And the more we absorb that reality that we're children of God, like, why am I afraid? Why am I insecure? Like, why do I feel want or need? Like, the more we embrace that and live in that, like, what happens is we just have an amazing peace that we get from God. We have an amazing love that overflows that we get as we are loved by God. We have amazing knowledge and wisdom as we just seek to understand the mind of our Heavenly Father. And we have a future that's greater than any future we could imagine. And that we shine brightly with the love and truth of Jesus. So much so, the darkness just is dispelled. There are many, so many people in this world that are so lost and so confused because they don't know Jesus. And all it really takes is for us to really know Jesus and really connect to Jesus, for our lives to shine with the brightness of our King Jesus. Verse 14. I'm going to end here. This is such an amazing verse. And the word, so just think of all it's said about the word, just God's eternal self-revelation, the logos that holds the universe together, the personal creator of the universe, the source of life, the source of light, all that became flesh. This stuff. Flesh, bones, blood, hair. And you're just like, how did he fit? Like, just, he's bigger than the universe. How did he fit into this stuff? And it's almost just wrong that someone so beautiful, so glorious, so amazing became this stuff. And you start seeing, well, that's why people missed it. Because he humbled himself to becoming just like you and I. Well, why? Why, why, why would he do that? This is beautiful. And dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. So this word dwelt in the Greek is tabernacled among us. Okay, Old Testament, in the um, the Sinai Desert, in the book of Exodus, what happened is God commanded his people to build a tent temple, and they called this temple the tabernacle. And so they had the tent in the middle of the camp when they would camp, and what these eyewitnesses describe is a glorious light cloud. So this wasn't like the clouds that we have up in the sky. It was a cloud full of light would come and descend on the tent and fill the tabernacle and light would shine through the entrances of the tabernacle. And this is the way they would know that God is in their midst and God is real and God is with them is because God tabernacled amongst them. 
Now, as amazing as that would be, what this reveals is actually that was just like the warm-up act. That was just a pointer to God tabernacling in a much greater way. That the ultimate way that God tabernacles among us so we can behold his glory is that the infinite, all-powerful, amazing God becomes flesh, becomes a human being, and comes and dwells among us so we can behold his glory. That Jesus came as a person just like you and me so we could see him so we could know him, so we could understand him. Because I think just as he fully is, I don't think our brains would be capable of taking it in. And so we start by seeing the man, Jesus, and we begin to see his heart, his love, his character, and then we begin to see the God who is Jesus, who is so much greater than any of that. And we beheld his glory, full of grace and truth. And Jesus just pours out grace He pours out truth. He's the source of light. See, all too often, especially if you've been a Christian for a long time, we get used to this stuff. It just seems normal and ordinary. Oh yeah, I've heard this stuff for many years. It needs to be unnormal and unordinary that we need to learn like to become like children and just be amazed and in awe at who Jesus is so we really behold him, so we really stand in awe of him. And that's the heart of worship and what it means to worship, that we see how valuable he is and how good he is. And so let's pray and let's invite him to come as we prepare for the table. Oh, Jesus. You are so much more glorious. You are so amazing. Like so many of the things that you reveal in John 1 just make our head go tilt. That we don't have the brain capacity to fully comprehend and understand how you are the eternal word of God who is with God and God. How you, the creator, the stars fit in a human body and walked among us. Draw us by your spirit to be drawn to you. Open our eyes and help us to understand you. Open our heart and help us to trust you. Help us to be men and women that long for you. Jesus, change our orientation from being people that are focused on the dark to being people that live for you, the light. Thank you so much that you have made us children of God. We pray that you would transform our view of ourselves so our hearts would long even more for you. We love you, Jesus. Amen.